Hi, I'm Steve Sugarud, and uh, I'm here with two of my heroes, really. This is uh, Mike Dawes, who won the best acoustic guitar player of uh, the last two years, according to, um, actually, I don't even know. My mom. My, my mom. mom, yes. Uh, that was uh, Total Guitar, what was it? Uh, so, uh, uh, something um, internet-related, which means it must be true. Absolutely, right, yeah. And then uh, this is my uh, good friend, Rick Toon, who I think is... Uh, Truly one of the planet's uh, uh, most creative and innovative guitar builders, really pushing the limits on uh, what's possible in the electric guitar. And uh, it's just, it's, it's, I, I don't know how, I don't know how he does it, but uh, I, I, uh, uh, Rick is a great friend and uh, these two just met for the first time yesterday. So um, I thought it would be great to take advantage of this moment. Uh, uh, they, they sort of come from different musical worlds, but uh, they're both pushing the limits of the guitar, and so I thought it'd be great to kind of get them together and, and uh, talk a little about a, a little bit about pushing the limits. And uh, but uh, really, I want to get inside your heads a bit, and uh, and uh, basically, um, instead of just saying like, "Oh, this is how you play this chord" or whatnot, like, how did that? How did the idea of pushing the limits? Have you always been this way, and, and where did it sort of come from? In any kind of change to the norm, I suppose starts with the genesis of an idea, and in my case, it was a sort of happy accident. Um, well, it wasn't so happy at the time. My mum, uh, bless her, um, dropped my uh, Epiphone Les Paul, which I had at the time, age sort of 16 or 17 or something. Uh, unfortunately, dropped it on the floor and the headstock came off, as, as, as Les Paul's kind of uh, quite a sensitive headstock area sometimes. And uh, as it was being repaired, I couldn't sort of play guitar. And as a, as a, as a teenager wanting to play guitar, I, I that that wasn't really cool. So uh, what happened is we had to actually get the headstock glued back on and it lay down sort of horizontally on a dining room table. In fact, to replicate this, could I just borrow, oh, your, sure. borrow yeah. your leg and I think, okay, Rick's hand as well. This is very easy. It's a hands-free situation. Thanks, guys. Um, so as, as the Les Paul was laying down, um, I began to sort of see the guitar in a different way. I began to see it as sort of six sort of pianos essentially, chromatically, rather than being sort of constricted to box shapes and, and patterns that I was already used to as a teenager playing Iron Maiden covers and things like that. Um, so what I did, inspired by people like Pierre Ben, thank you so much guys, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> inspired by people like Pierre Ben Susan, who's one of my, he's a French guitar player, one of my finger style guitar heroes, and uh, there's some family connection to him, a loose family connection as well. I put the guitar in dadgad tuning, which is, uh, for those of you that might not know that, it's D-A-D-G-A-D. -A -D -A -D. So dadgad is an open tuning in the sense that it is an open chord, right. it's a D-sus-4 chord. But it's a sus, not a... It's not a, a sus, yeah. and the reason I, I chose this was because it's it's undefined, it doesn't have a major or minor third. So asexual, it was, sorry. It was an asexual tuning, <laughs> exactly. And it, it, thank you so much, yeah. so he's just holding the guitar. But anyway, the point being that it was a sort of a blank canvas, but a blank canvas that allowed me to play with power chords, with maybe even just one finger. And I started to figure out you could arpeggiate major and minor chords and start to play around. Put Celine Dion vibes and just goofing around with interesting ideas from the top down. And what that kind of did was it, uh, yeah, it let me sort of see the guitar as, as as limited to my arm span and not to my hand span, and then when, thank you guys, sorry, and then, and then when I bought it upright and saved enough money to get my first acoustic guitar, an old Taylor, um, I sort of took that, the, the, way, the way I had viewed the guitar all my life had changed. And, and all the techniques, all the percussion, all that stuff, uh, inspired by Eric Roche, who was a uh, late great UK guitar player, um, sort of the UK's answer to Michael Hedges, I suppose. Um, uh, I, I got a lot of the percussion stuff from, from watching his Live at the Electric Theatre DVD, which is some of it's on YouTube, you should check it out, Eric Roche, R-O-C-H-E. Um, yeah, the combination of that and just, just the fact that I, I was viewing the guitar differently, that was the genesis of the idea, and I think that's something that's often overlooked when, when people talk about technique, you know. But have you come up with new techniques, do you think, just in order to achieve something that you heard on a record? Um, I was listening to Superstition by Stevie Wonder, and I was hearing the groove, the duke, chuk, 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 and I tried to replicate that on the strings of the guitar, like that, getting a percussive, a percussive sound out of the melodic part of the guitar, you know, in the same way that he's getting a percussive mm -hmm. sound out of the melodic instrument he's playing. Um, and gradually, this became a habit. This, this took a bit, of, a bit of practice to get consistent. And I, don't, I don't know if people can see it, but you're actually uh, yeah. using your first finger across so it. I'm sort of 
creating these little subdivisions in four beats, so a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a, with the first beat being a slap, and then E and a. Uh. So that's, with, with the slap I'm touching the top string, then it's drag, drag, off on the G string. But then I would alternate between kick drum and snare, so maybe a bit of swing. <laughs> then you can start freestyling with your, your other digits, perhaps picking a bass note. You know, things like this, perhaps letting the other notes ring. Then you're starting to get the melody. And you can start to, to let the song take place. So that was a sort of, in that instance, that was a just fooling around, creating a technique and then building a song from it. Yeah, you know? cool. But it's a musical way of doing it. You know, no one wants to sit in their room going all right, day, yeah, but, yeah. but to try and create a, a Stevie Wonder cover using this stuff is, is really, really cool. So um, that's the thing. I think when, when, when you, if you're a player and you're trying to enhance your technical library, always try and find a musical way to do it. Otherwise, you, it, I get distracted easily and I'll probably fall out of love with the instrument if I was just sitting there going, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, let's bring Rick in a bit too. Let's get we got your background, uh, the the broken Epiphone that uh, that laid you up and uh, and got you on your journey. Was there a, was there a guitar that was broken uh, early on for you that uh, got you on your journey? It was, it was uh, like a Les Paul clone when I was in high school, and uh, the thing just tortured me ergonomically and mechanically. And I thought, eh, I think I need to do something different, hopefully better. And so that's that's where it began. That and I fell in love with the Steinberger. I went to the music store, this, actually this music store, and they had one of the first earliest uh, Steinbergers there. And I saw that and I thought, damn, that's completely different and really beautiful. Mm. And uh, so, uh, did, what, what was your first uh, guitar? What did you build? Uh, you know, what inspired you to, uh, uh, did you go with a Les Paul shape, but different, or a Strat type shape, or a... Or a well, yeah. I loved uh, Alex Lyson's playing, so I, I built a copy of an ES335, um, but solid body. But it was that that shape because I just, I love that early mid rush stuff. So, yeah. but um, uh, in the first guitars that I, that uh, I met you, uh, it, was, it was probably eight years ago now. Mm -hmm. And the first guitars that I played with you, the 335 has the has the bridge pretty far forward, kind of like an SG, where you feel like it's uh, it's way out there. There's a lot of wood behind the bridge. And the first guitars of yours that I played. The bridge was much further back, so uh, did did a change happen in your head where like, well, this just makes more sense somehow? Or twenty years, twenty years. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so well, I should clarify and say that, that the first early experiments were done in high school. Um, that's when I first started building, and I took a long time off. Uh, had another whole career in teaching and whatnot, and uh, got back to Luthery about nine years ago. I'll say. So you are seeing the results of. A gestation period that had nothing to do with guitar building. Had a lot to do with running actually, because uh, I love to run and I am really interested in barefoot running and how the foot works and how ergonomics work and uh, that's translated very well to the instrument. How does your hand work? How does your body work? What's your posture when you're doing all these activities? I know you, it, was a, it was very important for you when you were starting out. You, you wanted to help people that had um, like uh, back issues and hand issues and such you know early yeah. on and uh, so you really focused on the ergonomic aspects of the guitar. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Everything begins with the mechanics. Once we have ergonomics and mechanics, then we can extend from there into electronics and style and visual and all that. But if it's not mechanically comfortable for you to play, then um, you're not going to get a good performance. So can you tell us uh, some some of the things that like this is a familiar shape in a way. It's a double cutaway shape, but uh, but you've got some unique things going on here. So can you tell us a little about some of those? Well, first I'd like to say thank you because this is a collaboration between Steve and myself and uh, um, Thank you Rick. It's yeah, and so you, you and I have been uh, arguing about uh, pleasantly arguing, you know, pushing the limits, uh, uh, you know, um, th thank you for allowing me to uh, uh, give constructive criticism and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and try and make things better every day, you know. Yeah, no, we're well beyond constructive criticism. We're onto, this, is, this is a true collaboration. And, um, this is a mighty guitar. Mighty guitar. Mighty, absolutely mighty. Thank you. And uh, so Mike, Mike got to play this guitar. You really plugged it in, what, two hours ago or less than that? Yeah, well, I was fooling around with it last night. I mean, I'm not an electric player by any means, but it's, it's something, well, I was before my mum broke my guitar. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, this is a very inspiring instrument. Um, the neck's very interesting as well. Very ergonomic neck, um, which, which looks very striking. Is this um, roasted? 
Yeah. Is it maple? Yes. We, yeah. we cooked it in the oven for a while. Yeah. And, uh, but it's got a very interesting shape, kind of fits around the hand nicely. Um, it's a very sort of angular thing going on, but it, but it feels very natural, very natural, and you really lock in when playing it, and it's, uh, yeah, very striking. And the pickup select is very cool. Mm -hmm. This is something I hadn't seen before, the 10-way the the switch. Oh, yeah, 10-way. Yeah, so this neck segues into a neck joint that's actually quite strong, and uh, I don't know if you can see it, but a big stainless steel plate there that bolts on. All, this, all the fasteners are stainless because it stands up to corrosion and sweat better. But um, it's recessed so it doesn't rub up against you. And basically, let's, let's call it a strat-ish shape, but it's offset, you'll notice. It's like a dancing strat. And uh, that allows it to sit at an angle, which is comfortable if it's your rib cage. They got the cutaways and, and these contours. and. Uh, and one thing that I, I, I found with, with Rick is that uh, he, he obsesses over the tiniest details, and, uh, um, but uh, one of them that I forget the details on is the bridge, you know, and I know it's a passion of yours, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, the bridge? And is, did you have a patent on this? Or is yes, this, a this is a patented bridge, and um, basically the concept is similar to, uh, to a violin. I was thinking about violins, and a, a violin has very direct string transfer down to the soundboard. And uh, this is basically a violin bridge that is adjustable up and down at the end of an arm that moves back and forth. And this is directly coupled with the top. So the vibration from the string goes down here, catches that, and goes directly down into the top. There's nothing like it on the market because it's patented. And it's, you can hear the difference in the string to string separation. It's, it's quite stunning. So I know, Mike, you were playing this a bit and uh um, I, I know you were uh, excited about it. Uh, can you share a bit about uh, what, 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 what was it that, that you felt in Rick's work? Um, consistency, first of all, because there were a few guitars I was able to play. And you've got a, a bunch. The one you were playing last night was quite a stunner as well. With the, oh, oh, Rick's other guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. yeah. Um, absolutely. And, and just, you can, the devil's in the detail with this stuff. And, you know, I play a lot of luthier built guitars. You know, I'm playing a luthier built guitar right now by my friend Andreas Kuntz over in Germany. This is my sort of signature acoustic guitar. Um, and, and the details really do matter and you really can tell instantly, I mean just visually without even playing, the difference between a, a kind of factory produced kind of thing and, um, and a luthier built guitar in the details. But not all, not, all luthiers, uh, not all luthier built guitars are cut from the same cloth and this, this consistency and quality, this is very striking as well, the carbon fiber situation. But this pickup selector is something I hadn't seen before. So it's a standard some kind of five-way blade, but when you push it down, it accesses a whole different, uh, different, different splits, I presume. So you what you have single coil and humbucker. Is that how mm -hmm. it works? Essentially, yep. yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and the bridge there, and then on the neck, the opposite, and then the the bass sides right. kind of humbucker bass tones, and then the treble yeah. sides kind of uh, single coil bass tones. But I also love the neck as well. I mean, I, I have a guitar at home with a very similar neck, but without the, the sort of ergonomic uh, back, mm -hmm. you know. And this this is much easier for me to play than that one actually and I think part of it's I mean we're in Florida as well so it's very humid I mean I'm sweating like a horse <laughs> on the beach um, and uh, and this is still very very easy to play and you know I do when I say I sweat a lot and the, the guitar tech Chris on the on the tours I do with Justin Hayward will will attest to that he's always complaining about rubbing my sweat off things and it does make a difference and this is very very easy to play down here by the swamps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and I, I think another idea that uh, was behind well, behind that guitar was uh, the ability to travel, like the ability to um, uh, have every sound that a traveling guitar player would need, electric guitar player, mm -hmm. and, in one instrument. Um, yeah, just plugging it in this morning. Um, I mean, last night I fooled around with it a bit, but but plugging it in this morning and really hearing how accurate this thing is and how you can dial in the sounds of your favorite classic guitars with this this ten way selector is really really very impressive. What did you see uh, in Mike's uh, performance? Uh, I know you guys literally just met yesterday, but uh, is there anything that, uh, uh, anything about Mike that uh, um, inspired you? Yes, uh, oh. he mentioned uh, detail. Speaking about my work, I would say the same thing. Um, tremendous craftsmanship applied to every note. It's really, oh, it's quite amazing. Um, you can tell that Mike really uh -huh. listens and there are not many people not many musicians that really listen. There are a lot of musicians that play, but a musician that listens is extraordinarily rare. And Mike does that. And, uh, and you can hear it in his playing. And, uh, you know, Rick, we were talking to some people last night, though, uh, 
and uh, they were really asking like um, you know they saw these incredible instruments that you have uh, the crazy one that I was playing last night and, and this one and and, uh, and uh, they were wondering what is kind of your creative process to, to come up with these uh, crazy but functional works of art? Hmm. Um, I would say overall it's a beginner's mindset. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I come to each instrument as if I'd never built one before. In fact, when I take some time off from the shop to travel and come back to the shop, there's a day or two of adjustment where I have to remember how I do what I do. Because this is all built by hand. Um, and uh, but anyway, I think having the beginner's mindset allows me to look fresh at each one, and that keeps it exciting and it keeps opening possibilities. So there's never there's never a path; it's more of an awareness, and the awareness is the is the key. Mm -hmm. um, something that both something unique that I found in both of you actually was uh, uh, when I went to Rick's shop um, for the first time in New Jersey. Um, it was about I'm um, eight foot by eight foot and everything yeah. was self-contained in there and he had one post in the middle of the room and he walked around the guitar would be on that post in the room and it was the most efficient workspace everything was in uh, a very small space and, and uh, I, I couldn't believe his woodworking or his fearlessness I said Rick I, you know this next a little uh, you know it's just a little wide for me he takes the guitar <laughs> <laughs> How's that? You know, I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. oh, well, yeah, we're getting closer. He's like, okay, well, we'll clean. That. But I mean, it was a, 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 it's a man who's comfortable with his tools to take a complete yeah. instrument and just. But I think both of you are very, uh, you know, efficient. You know, you want like uh, compact. You know, you you didn't want to to have any extraneous stuff. A lot of that's just laziness. Okay. And okay, the illusion sure? of being efficient okay. is like, oh yeah, I don't need to pack that bag because I'm being efficient. Yeah. In actual fact, I just try to personally, I try to live life without, with as few chains as possible, you know? So, yeah, well... Especially I, spending life with a suitcase and a guitar, and that's, that's yeah, about it, you know? Yeah, well, I cut think... Down on, cut down on the baggage. I think, I think Rick does the same. Well, well, I, I want to thank you, too, just for taking a couple minutes. We didn't have a plan today. We just wanted to talk a little about... Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. So, thanks so thank much. you. Thank yeah, you, guys. Thank you. Cool. Yeah.